Yeah, so thank you all for joining the Tutor Tuesday session. Um, this is basically a math session where I, I go over different types of math questions that would appear on tests like the SAT, ACT, uh, AMC Math, and just community submitted problems. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go through some warm-up SAT problems. Then we'll move into some harder ACT problems. Then we'll go into some community submitted problems. And finally, some problems from the AMC math section. And if you guys are wondering, uh, I have all my socials, my newsletter, things like that at explore.danstestprep.com. So if you like this session, you can go ahead and subscribe there and find more helpful solving tips like these. But anyways, let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with our warm-up SAT problems. So these should be our easier type problems just to get us ready to solve some of the harder ones. Let me paste this one in the chat as well. There we go. This one reads, if f of x is equal to x plus 7 and g of x is equal to 7x, what is the value of f of 4 times f of 2 minus g of 2? So for this one, we can just plug in the numbers in the parentheses into our actual given functions. I see we already have some answers in the chat, so let's see if that's right. We have 4 times, let me do it in uh, blue here. 4 multiplied by f of 2. But f of 2 is really just saying we took f of x and instead of x we plugged in 2. So that's 4 times 2 plus 7 minus g of 2. g of 2 is just taking g of x and plugging in x equals 2. Let me illustrate that right here. So that would give us 7 times 2. So in total, it's pretty simple to evaluate this. It's going to be 4 times 9 minus 14. 4 times 9 is 36. So the final answer should be 22. All right, next one. I placed it in the chat. The y-intercept of the graph, y equals negative 6x minus 32, in the xy plane is 0 comma y. What is the value of y? Okay, so for this one, we just have to look at, it's basically asking us for the y-intercept. The y-intercept is literally just when x equals to 0. So that would mean we get y equals negative 6 times 0 minus 32. y equals 0 minus 32, which is just negative 32. Hopefully pretty simple. Let's move on to the next one. The graph of the function f, where y equals f of x, models the total cost, y, in dollars for certain video game system and x games. What is the best interpretation of the slope in this context? Well, let's take a look at this. Slope is the rate of change. We're going to look for some kind of rate of change here. Each game costs $25. Mm, maybe. The video game system costs $100. Mm, maybe. The video game system costs $25, and each game costs $100. So I would rule out B and C here. The video game system costs $100, and the video game system costs $25. Because those are not... Those are related to the y-intercept. The y-intercept would mean that when we buy zero games, the video game system costs $100. So B is a true statement, but it's not correct because we're asking about the slope. For slope, we're going to look at um, when we buy...
buy one more video game. If we buy one more game, the price goes up by how much? It looks to me like if we go one over, we go up by $25. So for me, the correct answer would be A. Each game costs $25. Let's move on to our last SAT problem. This one. We're given an inequality. Y is less than negative 4x plus 4. And we're asked which point x comma y is a solution to the given inequality in the xy plane. To do this, we could just plug and chug or just test uh, different problems different uh, xy pairs, I mean. So what we could do, um, we could plug in 2 comma negative 1, and that would give us something like negative 1, let me do a better color, negative 1 is less than negative 4 times 2 plus 4. Then we get negative 1 is less than negative 8 plus 4, or negative 1 is less than negative 4. That is not correct. Maybe we try 2 comma 1. So 1 is less than negative 4 times 2 plus 4. 1 is less than negative 8 plus 4. 1 is less than negative 4. That's also incorrect. Now if we try 0 comma 5, we get 5 is less than negative 4 times 0 plus 4, or 5 is less than 4. That's also incorrect. The only one we have left is D, so it should be correct. And let's just check that 0 is less than negative 4 times negative 4 plus 4, but 0 is less than 16 plus 4, which is true because 0 is less than 20. So yeah, it should be answer choice D for this one. That's basically all our warm-up SAT problems. I want to move into some ACT math problems. So let me paste this next one in the chat. The ACT has a few different concepts. Specifically, um, I think they deal with a little bit more complex trigonometry. I see we've got some answers already. So let's take a look at this one together. Uh, for this one, since the ACT allows the use of a calculator, you could very well just plug in these values into a calculator and then just um, see which one of the answers matches. That would probably be the easiest choice if you don't know some of the identities that we can use here. So let's go ahead and do that method first. OK, so sine of, 60 de uh, sine of 60 degrees, and we don't even need a calculator for this. Um, if you remember with our unit circle, let me copy that over here, make it easier. Of course, you're going to have to memorize this when you're actually solving. But just for visualization, we can see sine of 60 degrees is going to be equal to square root of 3 over 2. Sine of 60, square root of 3 over 2. Uh, cosine of 30 degrees is equal to 1 half. Oh, sorry. Uh, also square root of 3 over 2. Cosine of 60 degrees is equal to one half, and then sine of 30 degrees is equal to one half. So in total, this thing becomes square root of 3 over 2 times the square root of 3 over 2 plus one half times one half. That's 3 fourths plus 1 fourth, which is 1. Now we have to see which one of these matches? One thing that I see 
here. Cosine of 60 minus 30 is not going to work, because that's going to equal to cosine of 30 degrees, which is square root of 3 over 2. Cosine of 60 plus 30 is cosine of 90 degrees, which is 0. It's not going to work. Sine of 30 degrees is 1 half. That won't work. Sine of 90 degrees is 1. So j would work. And sine of 60 plus 30 over 2, or sine of 45 degrees, is square root of 2 over 2. So that would not work. So definitely, j is the correct one for here. Now, there's also an identity that we can use that I will write down here. Uh, I don't usually memorize it, so I don't usually apply it on a test. And since these numbers are pretty easy, you can even solve this without a calculator. But there's an identity that says the sine of alpha plus beta, where those are two angles that you have, is equal to sine of alpha times cosine of beta plus cosine of alpha times sine of beta. So that's the identity that you could apply here if you want to solve it a little bit quicker, but not necessary. Okay. By the way, guys, you can submit any questions that you want me to solve. Um, but for now, we'll, we'll go over the next ACT math problem. Okay. So this one is for all x not equal to positive or negative y, x over x plus y plus y over x minus y is equal to what? Anytime you have fractions, any time that you have these fractions, you're going to want to get a common denominator. It's actually going to be almost necessary for us to solve this problem. The way I would do that is I would multiply each piece by what it's missing. So let me rewrite this here. x over x plus y. And I'm going to take this and multiply it by x minus y. over x minus y. And I'm going to add that to y over x minus y. Multiply that by x plus y over x plus y. Because you can see, over here we have x plus y in a denominator. In the other one, we have x minus y. So I'm going to multiply each piece by whatever it's missing. Then what happens when I simplify this? We get x times x minus y divided by x squared minus y squared. Because you can see here, when I multiply these two together, x squared will be our first our uh, first term of the FOIL. Then we get minus xy plus xy minus y squared. So the middle xy terms will cancel out. We're just left with x squared minus y squared. Here we'll get y times x plus y over x squared minus y squared. And if we expand this out just one more step, we'll get x squared minus xy plus, or sorry, over uh, x squared minus y squared plus xy plus y squared over x squared minus y squared. Now that we have common denominator, we can add these two. And you would see that the, these two terms, the negative xy and the positive xy, will cancel out. So we're just left with x squared plus y squared divided by x squared minus y squared. That's answer choice E. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, I'll be recording this and providing a session summary for you guys so you can look through it later. The next one is number 58. We have a cosine function as shown in the standard xy coordinate plane below. 
one of the following equations represents this function. Which one? OK, so for this one, if you recognize the structure of your sine and cosine functions, it shouldn't be too bad. Um, we definitely know it's cosine because they told us, and because it's an even function, it goes through uh, this top point here instead of starting or passing through the origin. Now we just have to look at the period of the function and the amplitude. I see that the function goes to a maximum value of 0, 1, 2, 3. Its highest point goes up to 3, and its lowest goes down to negative 3. So it's definitely centered around the origin, and it has an amplitude of 3. So we can rule out f and g. Now we want to look at the period. So from here to here, that's one period of the function where it passes, starts from the top, goes all the way through, and back up top. And we just have to count how wide that is. Let me mark that as one period of the function. So normally, um, let's see, so this goes from the origin up to pi before it starts repeating again. Normally, when you have cosine function, it repeats after every 2 pi. Normally, cosine repeats, starts repeating values after every 2 pi. And in this case, it's repeating uh, every pi which means that inside the cosine function, we're actually manipulating or scaling and shrinking it. So if, if normally cosine of x, or sorry, cosine of 2 pi equals 0, now we have cosine of pi equals 0. So we're essentially it's like we're doubling every input value that comes in. I can see one answer choice that looks like we're doing that. That's going to be answer choice k. The amplitude is 3. And for every input that comes in of x, we actually multiply by 2. So something like x equals 0 would give us cosine of 0, which is 1, multiplied by 3 to get the new amplitude. If we plug in something like, we can also verify by plugging in something like x equals pi, then this would become y equals 3 times cosine of 2 pi, which is 0. So that definitely checks out, definitely matches up. And the last ACT problem I have you for you here, it's a bit of a tricky one. So let me put it in the chat. If a publisher charges $15 for the first copy of a book that is ordered and $12 for each additional copy, which of the following expressions represents the cost of Y books? Let's read through that real carefully and then see what you guys think. I see a lot of people saying G, but keep in mind this is the last problem on the ACT math section, so it might not be as simple as you think. I see some K, some G. Let's go through this and maybe make a table that will help us find this function. So I'm going to label our X as number of copies and the y as the total sorry maybe let's do y for the number of copies because that's what variable they use 
and then let's call like this one or this column right here uh, total cost so if we buy zero books total cost I'm not really sure I'm gonna leave that as a question mark if we buy one copy of the book then it's gonna be fifteen dollars if we buy two copies well it says twelve dollars for each additional copy so that's gonna be fifteen plus twelve equals twenty seven if we buy three copies of the book that's gonna be twenty seven plus twelve which is thirty nine hopefully the pattern here helps you figure out the correct answer which if we work backwards here you see the total cost for zero copies or the base fee would be 15 minus 12 which is 3 so thinking about your y equals mx plus b format you've got an intercept of 3 and a slope of 12 so that's going to be choice f definitely choice F and you can check this one on the answer key but it's very very tricky yeah the only equation that will work here is the 12 y plus 3 and you can verify that by plugging in one book getting out 15 from from here two books and getting 27 as the cost it's very, very deceptive, even. Anyways, let's go through some of the community submitted problems. I had this one from last time, so let me go ahead and do that one. If you guys have any other problems you want me to solve, just put them in the chat. This one's saying, if x plus 3y whole thing squared is equal to x squared plus 9y squared plus 42. What is the value of x squared y squared? Here is the problem. And let me add the other problem that was submitted into my queue. I must have missed this problem from last time, but um, let's go ahead and expand it out. The left hand side of the equation we can write as x plus 3y times x plus 3, 3y because it's the whole quantity squared. That's equal to x squared plus 9y plus 42. Let me expand this out even further. If we use the FOIL method we get x squared plus 6xy plus 9y squared. Oh, I should have a squared here. And that equals to x squared plus 9y squared plus 42. Let's move things a little bit around. x squared plus 9y squared plus 6xy equals x squared plus 9y squared plus 42. Now we can kind of not focus on this x squared because it's on both sides. 9y squared is the same on both sides, but what's interesting is the 6xy and the 42 are different. They are equivalent, but written in a different way. So if we just equate those two constant terms, we can divide by 6, get xy equals 7, and then we square both sides to get xy squared is equal to 49, or x squared y squared is equal to 49. And that should be the final answer. Um, let's see, this one was already solved, so let me paste in this one instead. Someone just put in this one from the chat. So let's go over this one together. If we want to simplify this expression and 
only use positive exponents here, but we can, here's what we can do. Uh, let me just rewrite this first to make it a little bit clearer. 6m to the fourth times n cubed divided by 3m to the negative 2n whole thing cubed. The first thing I can do is I can use the rule of exponents that says if we have the same base like a to the negative, or let's say like a to the x over a to the y, this is the same thing as saying x a to the x minus y. So if I have two bases that are dividing each other, and then I can subtract the exponents between them. So I could do 6m to the 4 minus negative 2, which becomes m to the 6th. And then I also get n to the 3 minus 1, or n squared. Divide that by 3. And also, 6 divided by 3 simplifies to 2. So a whole bunch of simplifications here. The, remember, the whole thing is still cubed. And then with this cube, all I need to do is distribute it in. And that becomes 2 cubed m. Let me write it like this. 2 cubed m to the 6th cubed n squared cubed. My second exponent rule that I can use is if we have a to the power of x, whole thing to the power of y, that's the same thing as a to the x times y. So we can simplify this a little bit more. And we'll get 8m to the 18. That one was all clear. 8m to the sixth, uh, 8m to the 18th, and to the sixth is our final answer. And the last community submitted problem maybe has been already solved, but I think it's still a good example to go over. So this one is about error analysis. And if you guys have taken chemistry or done stoichiometry, this will probably be a little bit easier for you since we love to use dimensional analysis there. The error here, if you look um, in converting the 2.5 feet to centimeters, is something to do with the conversion factors. So we have 2.5 feet, definitely equal to 2.5 feet times 3.28 meters per feet times 100 centimeters per meter. If I said it out loud, hopefully you guys noticed the error. And that's right here, 3.28 meters per feet. It actually should be 3.28 feet per meter. Meters are larger. So in order to correct this, what I could do is actually write it like this, 2.5 feet times 1 meter for every 3.28 feet, because we definitely still want the feet on the bottom to cancel out this other unit, times 100 centimeters for every meter. Now you can see feet cancels out, meters cancels out, and we're just left with 2.5 over 3.28 times 100 which should be about 76.22 centimeters. Hopefully that one's all clear. I actually did math counts. It's pretty fun, but I uh, ended up quitting it. <laughs> 
But actually, some of the problems right here are from the AMC math competition, the American math competition. So that's going to be these next four. And hopefully they should be a little bit more of a challenge. I try to make it more uh, somewhat accessible to everybody. The first AMC math problem, let me paste it in the chat. What is the value of 3 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 third? This one is a next nested fractions problem, but we can pretty simply solve it just by evaluating from the inside out. So let me start rewriting this in green here. 3 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 3 plus so I'm going to simplify this 3 plus 1 third first. 3 plus 1 third is the same thing as 9 thirds plus 1 third, which is 10 thirds. So we get 3 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 10 thirds. And this becomes the same thing as 3 plus 1 over 3 plus 3 over 10. Because we can just, if we have 1 over some number, we can flip it to be, uh, instead of 1 divided by 10 thirds, it's the same thing as 3 divided by 10. Let's simplify it further. So we get 3 plus 1 over that becomes 30 tenths plus 3 tenths, or 33 tenths, right? 3 plus 1 over 33 tenths, which again is just 10 over 33. 3 plus 10 over 33. And finally, if we convert this to the same denominator, we get 99 over 33, that's equivalent to 3, plus 10 over 33. That's going to equal 109 over 33. So for those of you who said that, yes, it would be answer choice D. So the next problem here is also from the AMC math competition. The least common multiple of a positive integer n is 18, or, or sorry, the least common multiple of a positive integer n and 18 is 180. And the greatest common divisor, greatest common divisor of n and 45 is 15. What is the sum of the digits of n? Let's see. The options that we have, uh, the least common multiple of a positive integer n and 18 is 180. The least common multiple is if we take, if we take the numbers that we have here, um, it is the smallest multiple that those two, that those numbers have in common. So we could multiply, for example, 18 and find all its multiples like 36, 54, 72, and so on, up until 180. The integer n, we could also do n to n, keep finding its multiples, and it would eventually also hit 180. But before that number, there wouldn't be any common multiples. So it turns out that 180 is the least or the lowest multiple which is common to both numbers. Let me write LCM here. The greatest common divisor or largest common divisor, it's the largest number that will divide both n and 45. 
So what we could do here is we can kind of just check some of the numbers and see what works. Let's see, we have our, well, we can't really check these numbers since those are, it's asking for the sum of the digits. But what we could do is look at which, uh, we can look at which numbers would possibly work for n. What I can guess is uh, if we're going by the least common multiple condition, some possible values for n, and if we're going by the greatest common divisor condition, some possible values for n. This one could be uh, 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90. Those would all work for the greatest common divisor since I could work, uh, I could pick one of these and 15 would divide both that and 45. For the least common multiple, I could pick numbers like 10, 20, 30, 45, 60, 90. Those would be numbers that would all work. Uh, but let me see, these numbers, 10 would not work. And then, this is too high. The numbers that I see that would work here, the best would be 60. Sixty could be both the uh, could be n in the least common multiple case, and it could also be n in the greatest common divisor case, right? Because the least common multiple of sixty and eighteen. Well, if we multiply sixty, find all its multiples: sixty, one hundred twenty, one hundred eighty, and we also do the same with eighteen we'll get up to 180. And then the greatest common divisor of 60 and 45 is also 15. We could divide 60 and 45 by 15. And if we add up the, the digits here, we're going to get 6 plus 0 out of the 60, which is equal to 6 which is answer choice B. That one is a bit of a tricky one. But let's move on to the next problem. This one says a data set consists of six not distinct positive integers, 1, 7, 5, 2, and 5, and x. The average or arithmetic mean of the six numbers equals a value in the data set. What is the sum of all positive values of x? So there's a few different cases that I can see here. Um, the mean could not be 1 or 2. Those are just too low. Um, unless we had x as like a large negative number, that would bring the mean down. But remember, these have to be positive integers. So 1, so the mean of 1 is too low. A mean of 2 is also too low. The mean could, it could be 5, 7, or it could be the missing number x itself. We're not really sure. 
So let's consider each of these cases separately. If we have in case one that the mean of the data set is 5, then all of these numbers added together are 1 plus 7 plus 5 plus 2 plus 5 plus x, then divided by the six numbers that we have equals to 5. And we can also simplify this part. Uh, that 1 plus 7 plus 5 plus 2 plus 5, that's going to add up to 20. So I can just rewrite this simply as 20 plus x over 6 is equal to 5. And that would mean that 20 plus x is equal to 30, or that x is equal to 10. In case 2, where the mean is 7, we'd get the same thing, but it's 20 plus x over 6 is equal to 7, which gives us that 20 plus x is equal to 42, or that x is equal to 22. And in our last possible case, case 3, where the mean is actually x, it would be 20 plus x over 6 is equal to x. Or 20 plus x is equal to 6x, and therefore 20 is equal to 5x, or x is equal to 4. So these are the possible values for x. We get 10, 22, and 4. And then if we add up 10 plus 22 plus 4, we would get 36. And that's going to give us answer choice D. The 5 and the 7, so the possible mean of the data set could be 5, it could be 7, and it could be x. So I'm just taking the mean equation which is you sum up all the data items, divide by the number of data items, and that gives you the mean. And I consider the three cases separately of where the mean is equal to 5, mean is equal to 7, and mean is equal to x. Let's do one last one last AMC problem here. This one says let n equal to 8 to the power of 2022. 20, Which of the following is equivalent or equal to n over 4? Well, I can rewrite this. I want to be able to rewrite this in a way that it's divisible by 4 directly. So if n is equal to 8 to the power of 2022, 20, I might try to write that as uh, in base 4. One thing I know is that 8 is equal to 2 to the third power, right? So I can rewrite this as 2 to the third to the power of 2022. 20, and 2 to the third is the same thing as 2 times 2 times 2 to 2022. But a more useful way might be to try to write this in terms of a base of 4. So if I wanted to rewrite this as a base of 4, how can I get from 8 to 4? How can I express 8 in terms of 4? Well, one thing I could do is try to find a fractional exponent that works here. Right, so if we take the cube root of 8, we get back to 2, right? 8 to the 1 third is equal to 2. So if we do something like 8 to the 2 thirds, that would equal 2 squared. 
or we get that 8 to 2 thirds is equal to 4. So that means we can take this, 8 to the 2022, we could make this out here, or inside we can make it 8 to 2 thirds, and on the outside we'd take the 2022 and multiply by 3 halves to kind of cancel out the change that we made on the inside. So it's still equivalent here. And then we'd get something like, remember 8 to the 2 thirds is just 4, so 4 to the 3033 power. Then if we do something like n divided by 4, that gives us 4 to the 3033rd power divided by 4, which is 4 to the first power. And if you remember the exponent rule from earlier, this becomes 4 to the 3033 minus 1, which is finally 4 to the 3032nd power. So that should be answer choice E. Any questions on any of the problems that we've done so far? Hopefully that was all clear. I think that's all the problems I've got for you guys today. Some people say the screen sharing isn't working, so let me try that one more time. Yeah, I've got SAT problems up on the top. Maybe we have time for, I see one more question here. Uh, triangle trig. I don't have any triangle tri trig problems on me, but uh, let's see. I can paste in uh, uh, one more problem to solve here since we have the time. And I'll make some space for it right here. This one looks like a common denominator problem, again. It looks something like you might see on the SAT. The common denominator that we want here is the x squared minus 4. So what I would do is 15, 15 times x minus 2 over x plus 2 times x minus 2. Here, I would take this 2x minus 5 and multiply it by x plus 2, since we have an x minus 2 down here that we want to get into the right form. And this is equal to x plus 7 over x squared minus 4. Then we get, let me simplify this fully, we get uh, 15x minus 30 over x squared minus 4 minus, if we foiled out that 2x plus, uh, 2x minus 5 times x plus 2, we get 2x squared minus 5x plus 4x minus 10, x squared minus 4, and then we get that equals to x plus 7 over x squared minus 4. Let's do one more step here. Let's take 15x minus 30 and subtract off this whole thing. All right, so that's negative 2x squared. Then minus negative 5x is actually a plus 5x. Uh, and this is a minus 4x. So it's net just a plus 1x, which brings us to 16x. Minus 30 minus a negative 10 is the same thing as minus 30 plus 10. So that becomes negative 20. I just combine the, the left hand side there and then we get x plus 7 on the right. But it can still be simplified further. And if I just consider the numerators here now and I move everything to the right hand side 
we're going to get 0 equals to 2x squared, because I like a positive leading coefficient, minus what, 15x plus 27. Hopefully that's right. And then I hope that I can factor this as 2x minus something x plus something. I mean, it's also x minus something. Something like 2x minus 9 and x minus 3. Because the 9 and the 3 would multiply to 27, but they would add up. Well, well when we do 2x times negative 3, that's a minus 6x. And this minus 9x would give us to negative 15x. And if we solve those two, the 2x minus 9 equals to 0, we would get 2x equals 9, or that means that uh, x equals 9 halves. Or x minus 3 equals 0 implies that x equals 3. So let me bubble those in. x equals 9 halves, or x equals 3, hopefully. All right, I think that's about all the questions I have for today. So if you guys want, I have more solving tips on my Explore page, explore.dancetestprep.com. Yeah, you could take a screenshot. That Explore page has all my socials, like my TikTok, where I do other problem solving. And it also has my newsletter, where I send out like a weekly SAT and ACT tip. Yeah, so thank you guys for joining.